Cool, finally made it back from Slovenia. Well, let me tell you, Lynx Brutality was absolutely awesome. Thank you once again to the uh, Polinar Tactical Crew for organizing it. Um, if you haven't already done so, I highly recommend you have a look at our uh, walkthrough talk through in two parts that we did. Uh, all together this time, Bloke and myself gave our impressions and, uh, and uh, talk through how we did. So uh, as a sidearm, I chose, as eclectic as usual, the MAB PA-15. Um, and I had a couple of issues with it, which are uh, not really the fault of the gun, so I shall also attempt to clear its name a bit. Um, but yeah, there's not much information in sort of video, audio, visual uh, format about it, so I thought I'd try and correct that to some extent. So we'll go into a little bit of detail about MAB itself, and then about the uh, curious mechanical details of this pistol. So the MAB, or Manufacture d'Armes de Bayonne, was founded just after World War I by Mr. Leon Barthes. Now he was at least a gun dealer, I don't know whether he was a gunsmith at that time, but he had his own shop from 1904 in any case. So the first firearm built under the name MAB was the uh, Model A, and this was uh, essentially a copy, I don't know if it's a direct copy, but it's highly inspired anyway by the Browning 1906. Uh, in 25 ACP. Then follow Model B, C and D. Uh, Model C and D you encounter quite frequently still these days. Here's a Model D for example. And this was also quite popular with uh, say civilian authorities, so security agencies, um, municipal police, that kind of thing. Uh, and they were all in readily available calibers to the civilian market. Well, Leon Barthes passes away in 1937 and the firm passes over to his son Jean Barthes and business frankly is going well. Um, all the product line is selling well and they're good quality pistols. Uh, nonetheless you've got to keep evolving this product line and uh, from the beginning 1950s appears the Model R. Um, now this is essentially a reworked Model D again except we now have an external hammer and the grip safety is gone. Now these are all of course in blowback form. Uh, but this one, surprisingly, is in 7.65 long. Just checking for E in there. Um, so yes, this may have been an attempt to provide an alternative to the 35A and 35S, which was then still in service, particularly uh, in the protection agencies, uh, national police, and so on. Um, Frank and any military personnel able to purchase their own uh, service sidearms. Um, the Mac 50 had just been adopted as well, so 9mm was obviously on the up, um, but the 7.65 long was still relatively prevalent. Um, unfortunately, because of the way that the ammunition and firearms were classed at the time, it meant that this pistol and ammunition was basically unavailable to the civilian population, so um, it didn't really work out. So what they did do was then rechamber it for 35, uh, sorry, 32 ACP, um, and 380 as well, and they also made a beefed up version in 9x19. Now you can imagine uh, blowback, you know, it's a relatively small pistol, uh, straight blowback would be relatively unpleasant in a 9mm para, so uh, the beefed up version was slightly bigger, slightly heavier, and there's also a recoil buffer quite similar to in the Bayard 1908. Um, that said, it probably still was highly unpleasant to shoot, uh, but again, this was also unpopular. So despite this first failure, uh, luckily the sales of its existing product line, in particular the uh, sale of models A, C and D, was such that uh, business could continue as normal. And this meant that in 1964 they came back with attempt number two. Um, this really out of a more of a service pistol, and that is the P8 and the P15. Now the only substantial difference between the two is simply the magazine capacity, 8 in the first and 15 in the second. Um, now this is finally a departure from the classic uh, MAB pistol line, which frankly internally are pretty much identical across the board, um, and we now have a, a blowback pistol, but it is a delayed blowback pistol, and it uses a rotating barrel very very similar to what we find in the Savage 1907. Uh, which was, of course, imported in great quantities in the World War I into France. Uh, I've also seen it compared to the uh, nickel pistols, so which, which um, culminate in the VZ-34, and also the Steyr 1912, or Steyr Hahn. Uh, but 
these two are a little bit different in my opinion because uh, although they also have a rotating barrel uh, effectively the slide and barrel are together during a little bit of the backward travel and only when the lugs rotate sufficiently do the two separate whereas this one and with the Savage the both move at different rates immediately as you'll see in a second. So before we get into the physics just have a quick look at uh, the overall features of the pistol itself. Now as you can see it's uh, massively built this is 100% solid steel apart from the grips obviously uh, but it's definitely still a product of its time. Uh, for example it is single action only uh, there is a half cock notch and the only safety we have is this safety here at the back which we can put on when it's full cock and you can also put it on when it's at half cock. So uh, disassembly is initially just like a Browning pistol so you just push the slide back a little bit and then whoop, you push out the cross pin so far nothing unusual going on here. Now in terms of the frame we have here at the front we have a portion of the cradle which is going to be responsible for the rotation, guiding the rotation of the barrel and we can see here is the uh, transfer bar from the trigger to the sear and uh, this is a pull forward system. So the actual layout of the parts is actually quite similar to the Glock um, but um, yeah obviously pull forward is not the same but otherwise quite similar. Now let's turn our attention to the slide this is where things get a little bit funky. So uh, we have slide we have barrel and then we have this weird thing underneath so let's take out said weird thing. So recoil spring recoil spring guide and then we have this block which is actually the second portion of the guide cradle. So this slides in, very nice, good fit there into the frame and there you can see we have the full guide surface now for the rotation of the barrel. Uh, incidentally also uh, the back end here is the feed ramp for the cartridges. So let's have a look at the barrel itself. Now, very simple barrel profile but critical components are this big lug here underneath, the rectangular. So this fits into the cradle like so and is going to rotate in there. So this stops any backward or forward motion of the barrel. Obviously there should be the pin in there. Lock it in place. So this barrel can only rotate. It cannot go backwards or forwards at all. And then we have this upper lug here which is the cam follower and what is it following? Well it's following this L-shaped cam track. And you can see uh, as well how massive this frame is because let's not forget it is still essentially blowback and we are still handling 9mm so despite the little, uh, it's, I won't get it a gimmick, but the, despite the small recoil absorption by the, uh, the delay system you still need a certain slide mass to make it comfortable. Another little interesting feature if you can see here is that we have a barrel bushing in the front of the slide here and then it's done so that there is a I won't say as near as damn it perfect fit between the barrel and the slide so you get you know a good parallel uh, bore axis with the uh, action of the slide and therefore at least not guarantee but ensure good accuracy. So how does this delayed blowback system work? Well here we have the barrel uh, at rest so the slide forward and uh, you can see the cam follower there at the top is at roughly 45 degrees uh, which is actually quite a lot for these rotating barrel types they're usually you know, more in this sort of 10 to 20 degree rotation maximum. Um, so that's at rest. The cam is of course inside so the bottom part of the dog leg here of the cam track at this point. When 
you fire, of course, you get back pressure on the breech face. The slide wants to move back, and um, this cam track wants to or force is trying to force the barrel to rotate to the right. Now, when the bullet's still in the barrel, uh, the pressure is of course high, and the rotation of the barrel and subsequently opening the slide is resisted by the inertia of the barrel. And this is quite a heavy barrel. Um, plus the torque, of course, created by the bullet as it engages the rifling. Now, as soon as the bullet leaves the barrel, however, of course, the torque component is gone, and then the slide finally forces the barrel to rotate all the way through the cam arc and into the straight portion, and then the slide can then go fully back. And then, of course, the recoil spring takes over and resets the system. So here you can see it close up. I've just removed the recoil spring to make my life easier. So there is a tiny bit of motion where nothing, no rotation happens. And that's just the tolerancing between the lug and the cam track. Uh, you've got to have a little bit of room between the two so there's room for grit and so on and uh, so it doesn't bind. Uh, but as soon as the uh, lug engages the front edge of the cam track, we start getting rotation. It's already started and it rides up continues to rotate until it enters the straight portion and then recoils as normal. And then the system resets. Now you'll notice that the uh, cutout for the extractor is quite a bit bigger than the extractor claw itself. We compare the two there. Uh, this is necessary because the uh, barrel starts to rotate before the uh, extractor claw has cleared the rear end of the barrel, so it needs a little bit of room to move. So here's a bit of action footage from stage one of the Lynx Brutality. Uh, the trigger pull on the PA-15 is very good. Uh, we've got an excellent clean break, and the sights in this case are fixed. Uh, they know what they are. Um, now, in terms of weight, it is just over a kilo empty, and with a fully loaded mag, uh, or one kilo, 360 grams. So double-handed, it's fine, single-handed, it does get uh, heavy quite quickly, which is no good uh, for me with my horrible flinch. Now, it's uh, going quite well on this stage. Um, later, when I was reloading more, this happened. Now, what's happening here is that I'm using some uh, Swiss & Wesson uh, Model 59 magazines, and uh, it seems that there's two that uh, there's a tiny bit of wiggle room in the magwell and it seems that under recoil conditions if it's just right it's just jumping the uh, mag release catch ever so slightly and and then the uh, the mag slips it doesn't fall out it never fell out it just slips out enough to then not feed um this doesn't happen on all of them but unfortunately uh, original PA-15 mags are pretty rare, so it's pretty much the only option I have. So, uh, yes, sadly, uh, the PA-15 will be out of competition until probably I get a, a sufficient amount of original mags. So is the MAB still with us today? Well, sadly not. Uh, they started experiencing some financial difficulties from uh, 1976. And despite various attempts at restructuring um, partnerships, including uh, with Astra and FN, um, it came to no good and uh, they closed their doors in 1982. Now, concerning the PA-15, is that the end of the story? Well, no, because um, in 1984, some of the uh, ex-executives of MAB uh, raised the uh, factory once again under the name of MAB Co. And they carried on, uh, well, they tried to carry on the production of the PA-15, just that one. The rest, uh, the rest of the product line was over. And um, the idea was to propose the uh, pistol for uh, military trials. And they even came up with a prototype in double action, so to try and modernize it a bit. Unfortunately, the prototype was never ready in time for the trials, so it was never really a serious contender. And in uh, 1989, the French adopted the uh, PA Mass F1, the licensed Beretta 92F. Um, so that was the end of that. And quite frankly, it was the right choice given if you had the two. Uh, so with that uh, in mind, the uh, Mabco then closed its doors 
a few years later at the beginning of the 90s. So that's the end of the story, right? No, not quite, because in fact, parallel to Mabco, we have the MAM, so Montage et Assemblage Mécanique, based in Biarritz, now in, uh, in Bayonne, it still exists. Um, this company was apparently contracted by the French government. I've, I've really no idea of the details, um, but they were contracted to make PA-15 pistols uh, for various countries who were receiving military aid from the French at that time. Uh, so the numbers produced, um, we don't really know, uh, but this was going on then parallel to the activities of Mabco. Um, so now, surely we're at the end of the story. Yeah, I mean, come on, it's beer o'clock now. Surely I've finished. No? All right, fine. Um, sorry. Um, yes, so the truth is that the PA-15 is in fact still being made. Um, what happened was that once the project uh, by MAM had finished, now, Mabco had already gone before then, um, a certain Mr. Chevasson uh, picked up the, uh, the surplus parts, frames, and I'm assuming at least some of the machinery uh, from MAM and is still making them today. Uh, they are now custom items, but you can still get them. Uh, this is July 2022, and I contacted uh, Mr. Chevasson still uh, this month, and he did confirm that they are still in operation. Um, the only slight difference is uh, one of the, the, the side cut in the frame has disappeared, so it's more of a slab-sided design, and it's now called the uh, PA-15-2000, just to make it sound sexy. So, um, now I think we're really at the end of the story, because, well, there isn't an end of the story. Before I genuinely do leave you, just a quick word concerning the use of the PA-15. Now, we know um, it was no-go in the French army. Nonetheless, it was still used in uh, small numbers by certain agencies, uh, government agencies, um, you know, specialist military units, and so on in France and abroad. And perhaps the most notable are the couple of hundred that was ordered by the Finnish border guards, and that was in uh, 1975. Uh, now, concerning possible variants of the pistol, in fact, there is only one. That's uh, the PAP. 15F1, PAP being Pistolet Automatique de Précision, so the target version, um, that gets you a longer barrel, longer slide, and fully adjustable sights, but um, at a cost of an extra 200 grams. So you have a one and a half kilo pistol with a fully loaded mag. There you go. Now, this one was used by the French military, uh, various forces and police uh, for precision military matches. So now I'll leave you. Uh, hopefully you're still awake. And um, thank you again uh, for all your support. And um, we are look forward to seeing you very soon uh, once the weather is better um, on the range, or if not, here in the workshop. Bye.